Okay, I need some help. I need two volunteers to come up here to help pass some things out. Not to look at this. This is secret. No, no, don't pass that out. That's another secret. Now, these, pass these out, starting back there, these people over here, okay? Okay. Don't look at these. When you get these, keep them face down. Don't look at them, okay? okay. And pass these out to the front part of this and then all of these people over here. But don't look at them. Face down. Okay, everybody has one? Yes, sir. Everybody has a sheet of paper. Okay, when I say go, I want you to turn it over and focus on it. I, want you, I just want you to look at it, but I want you to concentrate on it. I want you just to kind of let that be your focus. You don't have long to do this, and so try to just see it as long as you can, as intently as you can. All right? Are you ready? Go. Stop. Turn your papers back over. Now, if I could have four or five people to help, everybody gets one of these and you can look at it anytime you want to. Okay? That's all. Let's pass these out to everybody. Okay, how many of you see a picture of a young woman looking into the distance, nicely dressed with a fur coat? and a feather in her hat. Just raise your hand. Okay. How many of you see the picture of an old woman with a large hooked nose wearing a shawl? Raise your hand. Okay. You didn't see the one? Okay. Now, if you look at it for a minute, can you see the one you didn't see? Does everybody see both of them? But can you see both of them? No. Those two, three drawings appear in Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, they are, as I am sure you have uh, tumbled to quite quickly, uh, one of them is a simple drawing of the young woman and one of them is a simple drawing of the old woman and the third one is a composite of both drawings. The book is laid out in such a way that when I first read it, 15 years ago by now probably, it's laid out in the order that I looked at the simple sketch of the young woman first, and when I came to the composite drawing, I instantly saw the young woman. In fact, it looked to me like nothing more than the same drawing that I had just looked at with a little bit more detail, which is exactly what it is. If you overlay those drawings, you will discover that it is the first drawing with more detail. I had difficulty at first seeing the old woman at all. I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. I had to study the simple drawing of the old woman for a few moments, and then I finally could see the old woman in the composite. And when I did, it was instantaneous. It was sort of as if she popped out of the picture. Kind of shocked me to see her. I thought it was a cute trick. I thought it was an optical illusion, actually not an optical illusion, but a very clever drawing. I've seen drawings like that before where you can see them one way, but if you look at them, if you think about it, if you focus enough, there is another picture in them. And I also thought that the young woman was clearly the dominant image. I really believed that anyone who looked at the picture without having seen anything beforehand would see a young woman. 
In fact, even now, when I look at it, I always see the young woman. I have to think about it in order to see the old woman. It's not difficult. I don't mean to say that. I don't have to work at it. But I have to be intentional. I do have to think about it. I have to remember that she is there. Now, just to test this, now you have to remember, this was a long time ago, 15 years ago, but just to test it, I showed the pictures to Elizabeth. Though I showed her the rough sketch, the simple drawing of the old woman first. I then showed her the composite drawing and asked her what she saw. An old woman with a large hooked nose and a shawl, she responded, looking at me as if I were a little bit crazy. It's not a complicated picture. And she could not see the young woman until I showed her where the ear was and that her face line, her chin line was down where the, where the old woman and then it popped into her view. It's a very simple way of illustrating the notion of paradigm. I don't know how well the experiment worked for you. We don't have the ability to control the environment, all the variables. It's an illustration that was actually used at the Harvard Business School for a number of years, a number of years ago. When the conditions are controlled, the consistent result is that about 90% of the people see in the composite what they have been primed to see in the simple drawing. There have been occasions at the Harvard Business School in which there have been heated discussions about the composite drawing. People arguing about what the picture consisted of. People who have difficulty, at least at first, seeing the woman opposite of the one they first saw. As I said, I don't know how well it worked for you, but it makes a point. The word paradigm, as it is used in the jargon, could be thought of as our worldview, the way we see things. It is the structure on which we hang reality. It is how we come to understand what we encounter. It's how we interpret it. One way to say it is that our paradigm of the world is our context. It is the systems of perceptions, prejudices, biases, expectations that all of us carry with us. It is how we understand reality. Now in a very simple way, oversimplified, the old woman, young woman experiment in the distribution of the simple drawing creates a paradigm. It predisposes us to see the composite drawing in a certain way. It isn't fixed or concrete, of course. Open-mindedness, creativity, suspicion that I was trying to pull some kind of trick, having an intention to be careful, all of these things make a difference. They make us more open to the possibility of seeing something else. It doesn't always work. But there is a predisposition. Now you might say that this experiment was contrived. Of course, when you look at a picture of the young woman and then you look at a more detailed drawing of the same picture, you are most likely to see the young woman. But that is precisely how paradigms work. It is precisely how predispositions work. 
It is a predisposition to see in a certain way. It is just plain harder to see that predisposition in the places where we live our lives because we are so familiar with them. They are so much a part of our lives. It is sort of like the old metaphor of trying to get a fish to describe water. When we looked at the second drawing, we were all looking at the same thing. In an objective sense, it was the same reality. It was a piece of paper. Each one of us held a piece of paper. And the same lines were on everyone's paper. I ran them myself on a copy machine. I know that they were all the exact same lines on a piece of paper. They had the same shadings. They were all copies of the same picture. And we saw different realities because we had different paradigms. It is interesting that it takes only 10 seconds to form the paradigm. That was the amount of time I gave you, was 10 seconds. There is data that suggests that it takes 7 seconds when you first meet someone to form a first impression. And there is data that that first impression has a powerful impact on how you understand all that follows. You interpret the reality of that person through the paradigm of that first impression. There is data that says that it takes about three hours of exposure to change that first impression. Now this whole thing is more important than it might seem. What we understand to be deeply true, profoundly true, is shaped by our world view. Our vision of God is shaped by the paradigms that we have learned. Our vision of God is shaped by our childhood experiences. It is shaped by what we perceive to be good, what we perceive to be bad. Are you familiar with Myers-Briggs typology? Mm -hmm. There's some wonderful work that's been done on spirituality about how people perceive God based on their Myers-Briggs type, their preferences. We will talk much more about it at a, at a later time. But people who see the wor world through their senses, prefer to see their, the world through their senses, tend to have a vision of God as being ordered, methodical, consistent. And people who prefer to see the world through their intuition tend to see God as being open, changing, fluid. So people on that end of the spectrum tend to see bad, they tend to see that which is negative as being that which constrains, that which stifles, that which blocks creativity, while people on the other end of the spectrum tend to see that which is bad as being chaotic, disorderly. And an interesting thing, I don't know what the statistics are today, but 20 or 30 years ago, the interesting thing was that the vast majority of clergy were on one end of that spectrum and the vast majority of the laity were on the other end of that spectrum. And no wonder we were not communicating well with each other. 